As you remember from last week, there are three kinds of forces in fluid dynamics. Last week we tackled pressure and gravity, and this week we tackle shear. There are a lot of similarities between the ways we tackle shear and pressure, and so I want to look back a little bit on what we did last week with pressure. Last week we said the net effect of pressure, which means basically the direction in which pressure is pushing or pulling objects inside the fluid. This net effect we quantified not with pressure itself, but with the gradient of pressure. And we took the gradient of pressure because if you take any volume and you put it inside the fluid, it doesn't really matter if the pressure on that side is very high, if on the other side the pressure is equally high. It is the difference which matters. And so we took the difference across space, the change in space, in each of the three directions, and we express this with a gradient. And that gradient is a vector and it points in one direction at every point in space. So it's a vector field. Now this week we do the same thing, but with shear. And I would like you to prepare a little bit for how we're going to tackle this thing, because although the method is the same, shear has a level of complexity above pressure that we need to, to tackle. So let's think about this. Let's think about shear in general. If I told you I have a USB key and I give you the USB key and on that USB key there is data for the value of shear at every point in space. The first question I'm asking you is what, what would this data look like? What do you expect this data to look like? Last week there was just one point, one data at every point in space, one value for pressure. How many values for shear do we need to store to be able to express shear at every point in space? That's the first question. What do you expect the data would look like? Second is what do you do about it? <laughs> if you apply shear to an object like a, like a cube like this, and you say there's one value of shear on every side of that cube, how many different points of data do you need to express, to store, to write, to be able to say in which way this cube is being sheared. This is question number two. And third, if we don't really care about how the cube is being sheared or, or strained for that matter, if we only care in which way it's being pushed or pulled by shear in any given, given direction. So if I only want to express the net effect of shear, in which way shear is pulling or pushing the object, then what do I need to do? With all this data that you collect, what do I need to do with this data to express that direction? And what does that direction look like? And how many, how many pieces of information do I need to store to express this direction? So these are the questions I would like you to keep in mind uh, as you prepare for chapter two, which happens next week. One, how to express shear in general, shear in space. Two, if you apply shear to a volume, how many different data points do you need to store? And three, what do you do about all that? Which means if you express the direction in which shear is pushing and pulling stuff around, then how do you, how do you take the value of shear in space and, and transform it into some useful information? With all of this, I hope you have a nice preparation for chapter two and I'll see you next week.